1982, Marvel issued an open invitation to aspiring artists and writers for a chance to contribute to the Marvel Universe. One such contestant was Randy Schuler from Norwich, Illinois, who came up with the idea of a costume upgrade for Spider-Man, a costume that would be composed of the same unstable molecule materials that made up the Fantastic Four costumes. Marvel would ultimately buy out the idea, and after several edits and revisions, would eventually form into arguably one of Spider-Man's greatest villains, and one of the most popular villains of all time in the Marvel Universe. What's going on guys? This is Rob, and today, we're going to be talking about Venom. So before we get too far into this discussion, there's a couple things that we need to outline. And the first is that whenever we're referring to the symbiote in this video, we're going to be referring to it as the Venom symbiote. And the reason for this is because in future videos, we'll be discussing the character Carnage. And despite the fact that Carnage and the Venom symbiote are related, they're two distinctly different entities. And so in order to avoid confusion, we're simply going to call it the Venom symbiote. In addition, as far as the Venom symbiote hosts, we're only going to be talking about Spider-Man and Eddie Brock, since those are two of the most iconic hosts that the Venom symbiote has ever taken on. So, when it comes to the Venom symbiote, it's actually part of a race of symbiotes. And the way these symbiotes exist, they go from one host to another, endow this host with superhuman abilities, and at the same time drain the host uh, to a fatal point of all the adrenaline. And the reason why this is done is because it's really the only way that the symbiotes can exist. Uh, when the symbiote gives its host superhuman powers, the host is very reluctant to cast off the Venom symbiote. It really kind of becomes a drug, kind of becomes a crutch. And so it's a very parasitic relationship. Uh, something is given, but the cost is more than the host is willing to bear if the host is informed up front of what's actually going to be, going to happen as a result of merging with this symbiote. Now, with regards to Spider-Man coming into contact with the Venom symbiote, it was actually an accident. Um, the symbiote, because of the fact that it had this drive to move away from going from one host to another and to bond with a host permanently, it was cast out by the remaining symbiotes of its own race due to the viewpoint that it was, it was insane, and it was imprisoned on the newly created battle world. During the Secret Wars timeline, which we won't go too much, uh, we won't go too far into, uh, suffice it to say that the Secret Wars storyline was actually a, a battle between uh, some of the most popular villains and superheroes, uh, which they were forced into at the hands of the Beyonder. Um, Spider-Man had become weakened during this fight. Um, he actually ends up coming into, into contact with the Venom symbiote, and initially his spider sense goes off and warning him, uh, warning him of some sort of danger, but immediately goes away. Uh, Spider-Man soon, you know, I would say that within a reasonable amount of time, Spider-Man begins to notice different enhancements that come as a result of merging with the Venom symbiote. Of course, uh, a couple of the most notable ones are the fact that the Venom symbiote allows him to effectively uh, shapeshift. Not to the degree that he can appear to be other people, but to the degree that he can appear to be wearing physical clothing. And this is a very big asset for Spider-Man because it cuts down on the fact that he on, on the amount of time it takes for him to you know take off his regular clothes and then put on a spider-man mask and then go running into battle or to save someone else instead he can just transform into his uh spider-man suit and or i guess uh transform into the to the venom symbiote itself and run and fight crime or do whatever it is that he needs to do the other thing is that it grants him this very, very durable form of wedding, a uh, form of, of webbing. And this is a much larger asset because when it comes to Spider-Man's webbing, it's an artificial webbing. Suffice it to say, there was one point in the Marvel Comics storyline where Spider-Man developed organic webbing, but that was taken away and he was back to making cartridges. But because of the fact that he has to make cartridges, the danger exists, and it actually has happened on several occasions, where Spider-Man will run out of webbing. And webbing is probably his greatest asset in terms of his offensive weaponry against uh, different villains. With the Venom symbiote, he didn't have to worry about that. The webbing was more durable, and it was unlimited. He would never run out of it. But there were a couple catches. 
Spider-Man, as time progressed, began to notice a few things. And one of the things that he noticed was that he was exhausted and lethargic almost all the time. And the reason why this was happening was because Spider-Man was actually, when he was going to sleep at night, he was not sleeping the entire time that he was unconscious. There were points during the night when the Venom symbiote would be controlling his physical body and he would be going around and committing various acts. At the same time, Spider-Man also noticed that the symbiote would move on its own, and in one of the most iconic scenes from the Venom and Spider-Man series was the nightmare that Spider-Man had, which was a battle between the Spider-Man costume and the Venom costume. And I can't remember off the top of my head if the Venom costume came out on top, uh, but suffice it to say, this kind of set off a few red flags. And so Spider-Man went to visit uh, Mr. Fantastic of the Fantastic Four and Johnny Storm of the Fantastic Four. And with the three of them analyzing the Venom symbiote, they came to a few conclusions. One was that the Venom symbiote was, of course, its own entity. It had its own thoughts, its own feelings, and it really kind of did things of its own accord. And this is where Spider-Man realized that the reason for his lethargy and exhaustion was because the symbiote was controlling him while he was unconscious. The other thing that they learned was that the symbiote had a fear of fire and a weakness to sonic vibrations or extreme sounds. And so they actually ended up discarding the symbiote, getting it off of Spider-Man and uh, imprisoning it in the Baxter building. Now the symbiote escapes and it travels back to Spider-Man's uh, home where it disguises itself as a spare uh, blue and red Spider-Man costume and tries to bond with Spider-Man again. Now, eventually Spider-Man casts off the Venom symbiote for, uh, you know, for the final time in what is probably the most iconic scene in the uh, Venom and Spider-Man fight where he's in a church and the bells are ringing and he's casting off the, uh, the symbiote. It's actually one of the, one of the coolest um, parts of the Spider-Man and Venom uh, storyline and it's one that virtually every Marvel Comics fan is aware of even if they're not the most avid Spider-Man readers um, that there are. Now, once the Venom symbiote leaves Spider-Man, uh, it really is kind of left with this embittered hatred of Spider-Man. And because of this, the Venom symbiote really kind of seeks out and bonds with individuals who have the same kind of hatred. Uh, the first host that it bonds with, and probably the most popular after Spider-Man, is Eddie Brock. Because of the fact that Eddie Brock had been disgraced as a fraud in terms of uh, news reporting by Spider-Man, he had this inherent hatred for Spider-Man as well. And when both the Venom symbiote and Eddie Brock merged into a single entity, uh, it really kind of empowered both of them and gave them abilities that didn't just belong to Spider-Man, but were also a little more extensive than Spider-Man's. But the most, I would say the, the biggest asset that the Venom symbiote has is that it is immune to Spider-Man's spidey sense. And the reason why this is so important is because Spider-Man uses his spidey sense uh, in virtually every fight that he's in. It's really kind of the upper edge that he has on almost all the villains that he faces. But when he's fighting, uh, fighting Venom, this doesn't exist. There is no spidey sense. Venom could be standing right next to Spider-Man disguised and Spider-Man would never know. So whenever, whenever the two of them are fighting, uh, it's always an extremely dangerous and an extremely deadly fight. And there have been multiple instances, there have been several that I can think of uh, in the Spider-Man storylines where Venom and Spider-Man have fought and Venom has come out on top, uh, on top despite the fact that he's never successfully killed um, Spider-Man. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, let me know. And I will catch you guys later. Peace.